All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to history class. So today we're going to be looking at some civilizations after 1500. Uh, today we're primarily going to be looking at stuff that's going on in the Muslim world during this time. So we're going to look at the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughals. All right. And I'll get more into like who's who and where they are and all as I talk about each one individually. All right. So to begin with, we have the Ottoman Empire. These guys are very important for basically the next 400 years of uh, European history that we get to talk about. Uh, they are a big player all the way up through World War I. Now, the Ottomans, they begin in Asia Minor or Anatolia or uh, modern-day Turkey. Is Those are all names for the same place, modern-day Turkey. All right? And they are going to expand into Southern Europe, into Asia, into Africa. They're going to create a very large empire. All right. So they get started here in this northern area of Turkey, and they're going to expand to get into all of this area in Europe. They're going to get all in through the Middle East into these areas a little bit here of Asia. We're going to get into North Africa a bit, up into like the Tunisia region. Okay. Now, yeah, all those areas that I was just talking about. And it's going to basically, they're going to hold on to a lot of these areas, or at least most of them, until they collapse in the early 1900s. And when we get to World War I, you will see exactly what I mean. And of course, that's you know towards the end of the semester. Now, the Byzantine Empire is weakening. That is what's left of the Eastern Roman Empire that is centered here in Constantinople. And they are going to start to weaken and they're going to, and we're going to see the Turks, the native people of Turkey. They are going to see this and be like, ooh, now's our chance. So the Anatolian Turks who basically take on this moniker as the warriors of Islam. They begin to raid into Byzantine territory and all the surrounding areas, start to conquer lands, converting people to Islam. And the guy who like gets them to start doing this is Osman or Othman. Uh, that's like the basic names right there. It's usually spelled one of these two ways. But for our purposes, we will be going with Osman. Uh, he's the first leader of the Ottoman Turks, as they would be known as. Um, he was the most powerful of these leaders. That's why he became the one in charge. And he's going to form the Islamic State in Anatolia. And he's going to expand. All right, a lot of Muslims were fleeing from the Byzantines and came to Osman's kingdom. And it's like, hey, things are pretty good here. Let's stay here. All right. Now, beginning with Osman and continuing in through his successors, those who ruled after him, uh, the Ottomans are going to expand and expand and expand, becoming an, a true empire. They are going to buy lands from people. They're going to form uh, political and marriage alliances. They're also going to do military conquest. And the leaders of the Ottomans, they take on the, the title of Sultan. So think, uh, you know, Aladdin, the Sultan, you know, he would have been a representation of like an Ottoman leader, basically. And Sultan means overlord or the person with power, like, like a uh, emperor or Caesar, Kaiser, Names like that. All right. Now, how were they able to do all of their conquests militarily? It's through these things right here. Uh, they had really good tactics. They knew how to use their strengths to their advantage, and they knew how to use their weapons well. 
and like they were one of the first people to use like super large scale amounts of cannons and gun pa- other gunpowder weapons like muskets so like they would have a lot of firepower whereas a lot of like europe in general is basically still using mostly bows and arrows crossbows uh catapults things like that for like long distance fighting but then you get the ottomans who come in with explosives and all of that it really changes the game a lot now they would befriend a lot of people who they came in contact with they were nice they wanted people to like them they wanted people to want to be ruled by them they would improve the people's lives like of the areas that they conquered so people would be less resistant to their conquests at least you know the regular citizens would be so all of these were methods they used for taking over their neighbors all right now the two main advantages militarily that we get to delve a little bit deeper in with the weapons and all of course firearms they were one of the first ones to embrace it on large scale in the world and we had these groups of soldiers called janissaries now these were christian soldiers who converted to islam and were extremely loyal to the sultans to the ottoman emperors all right and through the use of these uh, we are going to see the Ottoman Empire going through the Middle East, conquering the Holy Land, conquering uh, Israel, Palestine, Jerusalem, all right, and into Arabia, you know, where Mecca and Medina are the holy cities of Islam. All right. The Ottomans are going to get the nickname of, have, of being the Gunpowder Empire because of their heavy use and reliance on firearms to unite and expand their empire and to keep all of these people in line. Now, what is life like under the Ottomans, right? Typically they improved the lives and the conditions that people were living in for those they conquered. People who were not Muslims, right? They they were not allowed to serve in the military and they could still practice their religion whether they're christian or jewish or whatever but in order to practice your religion of choice you would have to pay a tax muslims would not have to pay this tax all right the leaders they were very active in trying to help and the people and be friendly like if you needed something you could theoretically like me as just like a middle class person i could go and meet the sultan if i'm you know in the capital city. All right, Orkan I, this is Osman's son. He would declare himself Sultan. He's the one who gives that, gets that title first. All right, and he's one of the first ones that really starts expanding through heavy use of gunpowder and cavalry and things like that. All right, now when they're going eastward, uh, they hit a bit of a speed bump. Uh, because of this guy here, Timur the Lame. Now, he, this guy, he was a Mongol like leader who was in the area that is now like uh, Iraq and Iran. Like he had territory there that he was in charge of for the Mongols out of uh, Central Asia. All right. Uh, when the Ottomans came into the area, Timur, who is called Timur the Lame because he had a bad limp. So, you yeah. know, he didn't walk very well, so of course they called him lame because he couldn't get around very easily. That's what it means when you say somebody is lame. It's like they, they can't move around very well. All right. But Timur, he was able to defeat the Ottomans in battle right, right near the modern day city of Baghdad, which was in you know, the same place you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. This was a big setback for the Ottomans but it did not stop them from eventually taking over territory. It just took a lot longer than they thought it would in uh, the Iraq area. Now, this is perhaps one of the biggest victories that the Ottomans would have when they take the city of Constantinople 
ending the Byzantine Empire for good. And they're going to rename it Istanbul, which is the name of that city today. All right. This happened under the rule of Mehmed II, and this was in 1453. And if you remember the Age of Expansion, the Age of Discovery lecture from, you know, a couple of days ago, uh, you will remember that this is what sets in motion the whole race for exploration to try and find a new way to go to India and China by sea, rather than the land trade routes that all come to this city, Constantinople, now Istanbul, so that they don't have to pay the excessive pay rates and charges of the Ottomans. All right. Now, here are a couple of pictures from modern day Istanbul. This right here, this is the Hagia Sophia. Uh, it is a mosque or you know, a, a Muslim temple. Originally, it was built as a cathedral, but it had since, uh, when the Ottomans took over, it was remade, it was converted into a mosque. And it is, in my opinion, one of the most beautiful, like, religious buildings in the world. All right, here would be the Bosporus Strait, that the bridges cross over. This is a very, imp this was part of the reason why the city was even built here in the beginning at all, because of all the boat traffic that would be here doing trade. All right. So Constantinople is renamed Istanbul. They now are on the bridge. They are the bridge between Asia and Europe, the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. So like holding this is going to make the Ottomans a very powerful economically, militarily, like forced to be reckoned with. Yep, so you can see Istanbul right here, right in the middle of everything. All right, now the greatest ruler of the Ottomans pretty much by a landslide is this guy, Suleiman. He would bring it to its greatest like extent, its greatest amount of power that it ever had. And he would simplify the tax system. He would reduce all of the bureaucracy, uh, basically less hoops to jump through to get things done. And he would basically create like the following of Islamic social law. So basically a more uniform set of laws based on the religion of Islam. He's going to get the nickname The Magnificent because like everybody loved this guy so much they thought he was like the greatest thing ever. And he didn't exactly like the nickname The Magnificent. He would have preferred being called The Lawgiver because he was all about law and order and making things run smoothly. But eh, it's still not a bad nickname being called The Magnificent. It means you did a lot of good things in your life. All right. But there was one thing that he was never successful at. Uh, that basically, <laughs> who was going to take over when he died? He had to kill two of his own sons because they were committing treason against him, uh, leaving his screw-up of a drunk third son to be in charge like after he died. So yeah, because of this third son, that's when the empire began a very, very slow decline that would happen over the next several hundred years, uh, ending in their ultimate uh, destruction. But yep, under Suleiman, this is the greatest extent. We get a huge chunk of European territory taken over the Balkans up into Eastern Russia, uh, basically into Southern Russia here. There's going to be a lot of con like trouble with Russia in their future, up into Hungary, so like near Austria. Uh, they get into the Transylvania area, Wallachia. Anybody who knows those knows that it's tied to like the story of Dracula, and there was a real Dracula. He's he was uh, the son of a of a noble named Dracul, so it's like Dracula, Dracul, son of Dracul. 
uh, who was very big in fighting against the expansion of the Ottomans into Europe. But of course, they ultimately did not succeed in that because hey, you can see here, they're in Ottoman territory. All right, so after Suleiman, the sultans became less involved in the government, leaving other people in charge of running the empire. So this would create more avenues for corruption to start getting in place, uh, just letting people who owed favors to families uh, get jobs instead of people who were actually qualified for doing the work. Uh, officials were very corrupt. They were, taxes went missing, taxes went up. Uh, the government didn't have as much control over what was going on on the outskirts of the empire. So this is when like Europe is going to start taking back their territory that was lost to the Ottomans. Now, part of the things that actually would make the Ottoman Empire work, at least for a very long time during its existence, was the fact that religion was the major unifying force. So most people were Muslim under their control, but they also had religious tolerance. That is very big for why they were so successful for so long. So they did not persecute Jews or Christians. They, anybody of cultural or ethnic backgrounds, you are free to be who you are. But you know, don't be surprised if you have to pay a little extra money to do it. And people were okay with that because they weren't being forced or killed for their beliefs. It's just, all right, I'll pay an extra, you know, couple hundred dollars and I get to go to my, my church. And I don't have to go to a mosque if I don't want to, you know, deal like that. Now, some of the things that we would get from the Ottomans, we would get coffee. So all you coffee drinkers, you can thank the Ottomans. They're the ones who brought it out to the forefront. Like it became a big trade commodity because of them. Uh, ceramics, like pottery. Uh, there's some very intricate designs and some beautiful pieces out there that have their origins from the Ottoman period. All right. Next, we're going to talk about the Safavids who were to the east of the Ottomans. So as the Ottomans are starting their decline, the Safavid empire is looking to rise up. This would be like the modern day Persia area. So like Iraq and Iran. Now, the Safavids were Shia Muslims, and they would attempt to convert Muslims living in the Sunni Ottoman Empire over to their way of doing things. Uh, there would be a large war between the Ottomans and the Safavids, and eventually there would be a peace treaty. And yeah, they, it basically is like, all right, you're going to be in your area, we'll be in our area. Let's leave each other alone. Now, the rulers, they were known as Shahs in the Safavid Empire. Uh, anybody could go and talk to the Shah. Like they were very like one-on-one -on -one with the people. Like anybody could go and talk to one. All right. Basically, I like there's, there's no difference. We're both people. We can talk. Now, they would actively trade with others unlike the Ottomans who tried to avoid doing business with Europe. All right. One of the big things uh, everyone's seen a bazaar, like you got the booths or like a flea market, almost that type of indoor outdoor type of setting uh, that comes from the Safavids and they would be very good with getting the trade going out there. Now, while they, they were blocked from a lot of trade access because of the Ottomans, so that's why they didn't really get as powerful as they probably could have had they had access to the trade routes that the Ottomans had. All right, now I'm going to talk about the Mughals real quick. These are the guys who are in India, all right? So India in the 1500s, the early 1500s is a big mess uh, jumbled around of Islamic and Hindu kingdoms. 
Now, a new Islamic kingdom is going to rise up and unite almost all of India under a Muslim-controlled regime. The Mughals or the Mughals, as they are pronounced, it's either way is fine. So you can spell it with the O or with two U's in there, and it's all good. Now, the Mughals or the Mughals, as I like to say is the Mughals, they are descended from the Mongol people. They are Muslim Mongols, so Mughal. And they start to form an empire in northern India. Right? They pretty much introduce Islam into India. And because of them is now how we get like modern day places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Nepal as having like a dominant Muslim uh, religion. All right. So while they did a very good job in expanding in India and taking over lots and lots of territory, they never were able to take over it in its entirety. Uh, there was a southern region, a smaller region, and uh, modern day Sri Lanka, the island that's off the southern coast. They were never able to get those areas. Now, there are three powerful leaders with the Mughals that you should know the names of. Uh, one is Babur. He founded the empire. Then there's Akbar. Uh, the biggest one, he lived up to his name being like a really great guy. And then there's Aurangzebeb. And these three guys we will take a quick look at. And just so you know, this is, while they're still in their expansion phase, the red, but Babur, uh, he would build up a powerful army sweeping into India and basically founding the empire with the territory that he got. Uh, then we have Akbar, who was a big time conqueror. He would expand territory. He would turn enemies into allies. Uh, a lot of cultural blending between the, uh, the original Hindu people and with the new coming Islamic people. All right, uh, he would bring religious tolerance into the Mughal Empire. So, yeah, you want to be Hindu, be Hindu. You want to be Muslim, be Muslim. All right, and that's one of the reasons why he was one of the greatest emperors like, of the Mughals. Uh, he would use heavy amounts of gunpowder weapons to bring India, a lot of India, under control. Um, he took, ta he took away taxes on non-Muslims. So basically just, you can practice whatever you want. You don't even have to pay to do it. Everyone had the same rights. That's a really, really big thing right there. Everybody was equal under the law, all right? His rule was fair when it came to money and he would also like get rid of taxes if there was a bad harvest, but like, hey, Keep your money, use it to buy whatever food that you can get your hands on. Like that's, that's really something like, there's a reason why he's called the great one. And that's why. All right. Then we get just a special uh, insert here. Shah Jahan. All right. Uh, this guy, when he came to power, killed anybody who could potentially be a threat to his rule. Um, that is basically him killing a bunch of his family members. He had two things that he enjoyed besides killing his family members early on. Uh, buildings and his wife. If there's one good thing that we can say about Shah Jahan, uh, it is that he was a devoted and loving husband. His wife, Mamtaz Mahal, uh, she died when she was 38, giving birth to their 14th child. And because and to celebrate his wife and to immortalize her, he ordered like the greatest of all shrines to a spouse that a person can do, uh, the Taj Mahal to be built in her honor. Now, yeah, it's going to be very costly. Um, 30 villages and almost bankrupting the entire empire to get it built. 
so like 30 villages of workers, I should say. Uh, he, th this quote is from him. He wanted this building, this tomb for her to be built to be as beautiful as she was beautiful. Try to live up to that one, right guys? All right, for those of you who don't know what the Taj Mahal looks like, here it is. One of the most beautiful buildings in the world, I would say. But there's a very dark side to this. While it is one of the greatest wonders of the world, um, 20,000 workers over the course of 22 years, after they were done, he had all the workers' hands cut off so they could never build anything more beautiful than that building. And the empire was in severe catastrophic debt because of that building. But now it's one of the biggest tourist attractions that there is in India. So I guess there's a silver lining there somehow. All right. Akbar, the greatest of them, he's the one who expanded all the pink area. And then under Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, they would expand into it even further into the purplish areas. So those gray areas down at the bottom, Sri Lanka, the island, and then the tip there, that is the parts they were never able to conquer. The people there just put up too strong of a fight for them. Now, Shah Jahan, yeah, a lot of tragedy, a lot of economic troubles because of wanting to build that shrine to his wife. Though, yeah, the worst thing he ever did was his son, Aurangzeb. This, this guy was just even worse, apparently. So, yeah. Um, he was the opposite of his great-grandfather, Akbar. So if Akbar is the greatest one, this guy is the worst one. Uh, he expanded it to its largest, the empire to its largest size, but he was very intolerant. He hated people who were non-Muslim. Uh, he would outlaw gambling and drinking. He banned the Hindu rituals, which you know would be different ones every you know every couple of weeks basically. Uh, he forbid people to build temples to the Hindu gods, and he wanted to forcefully convert the people to Islam. Now, of course, this would eventually cause the empire to start breaking down, and yeah, because there's no longer support by the people. You have to win the hearts and minds of the people in order to keep anything together. All right, and this would weaken the empire enough to have start having outsiders have influence within the empire and that's going to further cripple them even more now the mughals would have trade relations with europe they're basically the ones in charge when guys like uh the portuguese came in and found the sea route to india all right so we're gonna start getting more and more different european countries getting involved and be, they would start to, they would stay independent, but they're going to start making some concessions here and there. So the Portuguese, the English, uh, the Dutch, they would start having trade posts and getting their hands on some port cities that they would have some control over with like oversight by the Indians. And that's kind of how the sphere of influence grows in India because they were after textiles, you know, cloth. You have the silks and different things like that in India, which are very, very popular and wanted very much for the luxury aspect of it in Europe. All right. Now the ultimate downfall for the Mughal is basically when the Western traders start to build more and more power in India. And this is, of course, under Shah Jahan. And all the debt, it's, it just is a perfect storm for India to start losing its power over itself and to start being a puppet for the Europeans. But, of course, then there's southern India. There was... They would trade with the Europeans as well. And 
They never became, came under anybody's control. They stayed independent like the whole time. And they would trade in things like silk, gemstones, and spices. All things that the Europeans wanted. All right, the British, they would gain the most influence in India, uh, sometimes by force, sometimes by bribing people, sometimes just because they threw a bunch of money around and bought people and things. Uh, it would eventually become a British colony, just like, you know, Virginia and Pennsylvania, the other, you know, the 13 colonies in North America. It basically became like that in India. And this would be just like with other colonial powers, uh, it would set in several hundred years worth of oppression that would eventually lead to revolution. All right, that's where we're gonna stop today. Uh, when we come back to next time, we will be taking a look at a couple more places around the world, like uh, China and Japan during the after 1500s period.